Tandwat Pranam Maharaj, thank you so much for joining us here at ISKCON Sydney. This program is called One on One and it's an initiative we've taken up here to try and get to know better all of the sadhus who visit us and inspire us already so much. To begin, off, to begin with, I'd just like to ask you how your journey was coming into contact with ISKCON and who you were before coming into contact with the Krishna Consciousness sort of movement and how that sort of transformed. Yeah, I was pretty much nobody because uh, I joined when I was 21 and uh, never really worked a um, little bit tried business before uh, joining but even that was too boring for me but actually it helped me because uh, I had more money than I could spend and I completely burned myself out with sense gratification so I was totally convinced that there is no happiness in the material world so and after joining the movement it was uh, easy to understand uh, Prabhupada's philosophy that it's all true by personal experience. Yeah and sort of specifically at what point would you say you first came into contact or was it through book distribution or through lectures or? Well because uh, that was in Russia in 80s and at the time the movement was uh, criminalized and uh, many devotees were in jail or uh, prosecuted and they were not preaching openly and it was very very hard to come across devotees or Prabhupada's books and uh, I uh, was practicing Islam at the time and uh, my grandmother taught me some prayers and uh, since my childhood I had experienced that whenever I prayed I was getting reciprocations so I had no doubt about the existence of God but at some point I wanted to know a little more about him and it was a little frustrating because in all the Abrahamic scriptures like Quran, Bible, Torah, there is no mentioning of who God is and where does he live, what is he doing, etc. All this information was not available. And I was looking for that. And uh, at the same time, I was very young and passionate and I wanted to do something for God and uh, my enemies were communists <laughs> because they were classical atheists and they were really screwing the, the whole country up and uh, you know my family suffered from their atrocities and I decided that I will be disseminating truth about them and uh, I nearly got in jail for that but actually Krishna saved me <coughs> and um, I was looking for some sources of spiritual knowledge but there was nothing available and uh, one time I came across one communist uh, brochure describing different cults uh, existing in Western countries and I was curious so I got that brochure and I've noticed that one group was, des was, described, was described with real hatred because uh, the article was saying that of all the cults this is the worst because all the people are completely crazy there men are wearing bed sheets, uh, women are wearing uh, curtains and people putting dirt on their foreheads and uh, men are shaving their heads not completely some part of the head remains unshaven and looking weird like this they go out on the streets and harass people trying to sell them books no one can understand and if they don't get enough money they become really frustrated and they start either shouting or murmuring to themselves meaningless words <laughs> and it was quoted Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Rama Rama, Hare Hare 
And when I came across this description, I was thinking, of course, this psychology was the enemy of my enemies, my friend. So because it was coming from communist sources, I was taking that <clears throat> in a very skeptical way. And I thought that these people cannot be really crazy because they follow discipline. And four of the principles were mentioned as part of their insanity. You know, like people not even drinking Russian vodka. These must be really mad people. <laughs> but I was thinking if people are following such a discipline, they cannot be crazy because crazy people can never follow any discipline. And plus, I was thinking, if these people are crazy, then why do they chant the same words? So these words must have some meaning. It's a lie that these words are meaningless. And I have to find out what is this Hare Krishna. And I started asking my friends if they know anything about Krishna. And one friend said, yes, we have them and I know a few of them and uh, they have very interesting books so on my request he brought a few books and I started reading and these were small books but they were referring to Bhagavad Gita so and they immediately figured out that Bhagavad Gita is the main book so I said can you get Bhagavad Gita for me and he said no this is very dangerous because for this book both of us can go to jail for many years. But I was insisting and he said, okay, I'll bring, but make sure that no one sees us. So he brought Bhagavad Gita and uh, immediately upon opening it, I realized this was the book I wanted uh, to read my whole life because everything about yoga, meditation, karma, reincarnation was plain in there. And I started asking him if I could borrow that book and read it. He said, no, this is too dangerous. I tried to bribe him. I said, I'll give you any money you want. He said, no, I don't want to risk because, you know, I don't want to lose my freedom for money. So he declined. And uh, after that, I spent maybe three years trying to get my own copy of Bhagavad Gita. But I didn't even know where to look because, you know, internet was not available at the time and everything was so restricted. And uh, after three years I lost hope and suddenly I was walking down the street and one young man approached me and he said, I have some spiritual books if you want to read. And then I immediately sensed that he had Bhagavad Gita. And this was the very first book he pulled out. I was so happy that finally I see Bhagavad Gita. And uh, I was ready to pay him anything he asks, but he said, you know, just give me whatever little donation. <laughs> I was so surprised that he is parting with such a valuable book for no, you know, for next to nothing. I had no idea about book distribution back then. And then I started reading the books and sharing with my friends, etc. Some were very enthusiastic about discussing the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. Others were not very happy with that. I lost one friend, for sure, uh, because I read part of the purport where Prabhupada describes hardworking people as asses. And this friend of mine was working very hard, he had two jobs. And he said, so this book is considering me an ass, I don't want to know you and I don't want to know this book. So you know, he was, became very angry with me. Um, and also I came across one uh, friend of mine and he was uh, son of a minister and uh, he was very proud of his position he had super uh, luxurious apartment and a lot of wealth and he was inviting uh, us and giving very expensive gifts and he was behaving in a very aristocratic way so he was trying to cut like topmost profile etc and we were like really young i was maybe 16 he was 17 or maybe 18 at most 
but he was very learned and I thought he would be a good man to discuss Bhagavad Gita with. So I brought Bhagavad Gita and uh, I said, what do you think about Bhagavad Gita? And he's, to my surprise, he said he never even heard that name before. I said, well, this is one of the most famous books on spiritual philosophy coming from ancient India. And he was even embarrassed that he never heard of it after he learned that so many famous people read and appreciated Bhagavad Gita. And uh, this Bhagavad Gita was also printed illegally on the ground and it added some, you know, intrigue. And so he opened the book and he landed somewhere in the middle. Maybe chapter 9 or 10 where Krishna speaks about his opulences. And his face started, uh, his facial expression changed to confusion and then to disgust and anger. I was very surprised what's happening with him. And he said, who is that Krishna anyway? I said, well, Krishna is the Supreme Lord. And he said, and he was shouting at that point, he said, if Krishna is the Supreme Lord, and then he added few swear words, which was complete shock for all of us, you know, such a person on such a level using swear words, he said he should be more modest about it. And he literally threw the book in my hands and he turned around and, uh, and we looked at each other and we couldn't believe it, you know. It was as if he became like suddenly possessed by some evil spirit or something. And I was really confused at the time, but then later I learned what happened. Because Prabhupada says when people come in touch with Krishna consciousness, their real colors come out. It's like lemon when it is squeezed in the milk, divides milk into whey and yogurt and curd. In the same way, when society comes in touch with Krishna consciousness, it segregates into divine and demonic. And so the real nature comes out. And so I've realized, you know, this guy, he was thinking he was God, but then he was reading about real God. And so he couldn't contain, contain you know, control his envy. So that came out. That was very interesting to see. And then, uh, but number of friends did appreciate that, and we even chanted Hare Krishna and all these things. So this was the beginning of my introduction to Krishna consciousness. And then later I came across the devotees and started practicing. Yeah, Maharaj, you mentioned that the copy of Bhagavad Gita that you had was printed underground. Are there any other further dimensions of, say, um, things that we aren't accustomed to here that you encountered while the devotees were running underground? Oh yeah, of course. It was a very interesting time because uh, when I joined the movement uh, it was still not really legal. It was a little bit more recognized because Western devotees, specifically Sri Prahlad Prabhu, uh, he was the pioneer, he, they put a lot of pressure on Russian government to release the devotees. So devotees came out of jail and then they were hoping that they could have more freedom to preach. And European Bhaktivedanta Book Trust printed uh, quite a serious uh, number of books in Russian language and they sent them as a gift to Russian devotees and it was about quarter million copies. Krishna book, Bhagavad Gita and teachings of Lord Chaitanya. But Russian customs were not releasing the books because they realized if we had so much trouble with Hare Krishnas when they were underground, if we allow them books now they would convert the whole country probably and uh, they were very hesitant and but devotees wanted books out and so all the devotees gathered together in Moscow and uh, they started harinams of protest uh, in front of most prominent uh, like government and other buildings like different embassies and news agencies and all and so this was my first serious engagement with the movement. I was distributing little books here and there, 
but then when we were called to gather together to you know demand the release of the books that was like serious political action and we were attacked by police and beaten by the riot forces and thrown into jail for a short while so it was quite a fun but uh, yeah because you know it was very easy to surrender to Krishna under such circumstances and uh, yeah it was very adventurous but Krishna pr was protecting us in all circumstances this was my experience yeah that's amazing we don't have that issue here we um we see then now obviously you've entered into the sannyas ashram which is the most elevated a uh, sort of element of monasticism we have in ISKCON how did you sort of trace that journey from being a book distributor new to ISKCON all the way to taking up such a esteemed and austere position? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's really austere, at least in ISKCON. I mean, there are subtle austerities involved, but uh, and maybe traveling, but I really like traveling. Probably this was one of the reasons. But uh, yeah, I kind of felt that the best service I could render would be to take some responsibility for the movement and I didn't really worry about positions so much, I was just trying to do something good and then, you know, if you try to do something uh, then naturally senior devotees offer positions so um, but uh, yeah I was pretty happy as brahmachari traveling preaching organizing different things I was not really uh, thinking about sannyas but then uh, my spiritual master mentioned number of times you know that first time when I was a little bit over 30 he said, uh, you are not so fortunate as Prabhupada disciples to join the movement earlier because you would be sannyasi a long time back if you would learn, if you would join then because he said, I took sannyas when I was 29 and you were already over 30. That was first mention and then number of times he was asking me, so you have any plans? for family life. I said, not really. I'm not really interested in that. And uh, then at some point he said, if you don't have uh, plans, then maybe you should start moving towards sannyas. And I asked him, so but what would be the difference? Because pretty much the same thing I'm doing now, uh, I could do as sannyasi. So what would change? And he told me that if you take sannyas, your service and your preaching would be much better facilitated, which I realized is true because something um, I could do after taking sannyas was to organize the training courses we are running at the moment in uh, Mayapur. That's going to be already third year and we call those courses IDEAL which stands for Innovative Development to Empower Authentic Leaders and uh, we have very serious faculty members like Krishna Kshetra Maharaj and Mother Urmila and Rasamandala Prabhu came at the first year Pancharatna Prabhu is very steadily with us Anuttama Prabhu is teaching and many other uh, high level teachers and training uh, trainers uh, come uh, because I request them to do so which I don't think would be possible uh, if I would just be a brahmachari so I think uh, that was very beneficial in that sense and have you found any particular, besides advantages, have you found any particular, say, challenges that have come up with that shift? Uh, yeah, it was very interesting because uh, 
surprisingly enough, nothing changed, but it became extreme. Like some devotees treat me much better than I deserve. I discovered there is a whole group of devotees who hate me, even though they never met me and never we never associated. But just because, you know, in their mind, sannyas represents official part of Wisconsin, so I became their enemy number one just by dint of that fact. And uh, yeah, they tried to, you know, I, it was very interesting that they said, you know, there is a whole group of devotees who claim to be pure followers of Srila Prabhupada, and they say that number of people are destroying Prabhupada's movement, and they find faults with many leaders, and um, very interesting, they kind of published number of pictures of leading senior Vaishnavas in Iskon and describing their so-called faults. And then they put my picture next to theirs. They say, he's also the man who destroys Prabhupada's movement. And I was very happy, you know, because you know, I, I was very honored, you know, to be <laughs> in such, you know, category. I was thinking, wow, my God. They hate me as much as, uh, you know, leading senior Vaishnavas. What an honor. <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately. If people do not really practice seriously Krishna consciousness themselves, they feel, you know, very deep guilt and sense of, uh, what do you call it, um, defeat. And just to distract their mind from that fact that they failed in their own Krishna consciousness, they try to find fault with the movement and with the leaders, trying to, you know, figure out whose fault is that, that I'm not really advancing in Krishna consciousness. So, yeah, that's what, unfortunately, that's a very common trap. And with that lashing out that you receive, how do you, how do you find would be the best way to say to recommend to other devotees who also, maybe not on the same scale, yeah, would also yeah. receive some criticism? Uh, how would you say is a way to approach that, to work through it? Well, I mean, uh, anyone who is criticized uh, in this movement should be very happy because only people who do something serious are criticized so that's an indication it's kind of you know acknowledging <laughs> that something is done and plus as Mahabharat mentions that whoever is criticizing and blaspheming us is sharing with us his best karma and gets all the bad karma of you know purifies us of the effects of our bad karma so we don't lose anything that's why Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati said whoever criticizes me is my friend <laughs> but we should feel sorry for these people of course because the kind of future they preparing for themselves is very dark so coming back to that project you were mentioning, that academy, that uh, seems to be a big passion of yours. We've heard about it a few times at uh, your different preaching events. I was just wondering what sort of personally made you get passionate about it and be invested in it as something that's needed within ESCON? Well, combination of number of things and first is of course, first purpose of ESCON, which is uh, very broad which is to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large and educate all people in the techniques of spiritual life in order to check the imbalance of values in life and achieve real unity and peace in the world. So Damodar Prabhu, who is uh, in Australia now, British Damodar Prabhu, he mentioned that interestingly enough the first purpose of Wisconsin does not even mention the word God what to speak of Krishna because Prabhupada envisioned global um, spiritual upliftment of the society initiated by the Krishna consciousness movement and that's why he put this purpose in the first place and uh, this should be our understanding and responsibility for the global upliftment of the planet rather than trying to promote 
our religion versus other religions. If Krishna consciousness would be another religion, why Lord Krishna would say in the end of Bhagavad Gita, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. And so we can understand that Krishna consciousness is spiritual science which is above and beyond any sectarian um, ideas. <clears throat> and um, whoever reads Bhagavad Gita also knows about it. So it's very clearly spelled out in all Prabhupada's books. And we can see Prabhupada's desire was an ambition to uh, uplift the entire society spiritually. And uh, interestingly enough, um, Prabhupada was acting as spiritual entrepreneur. I've done this presentation on the basis of one article, 12 signs of spiritual entrepreneur. And Prabhupada really fits into that picture perfectly. And uh, my conviction, as well as the conviction of uh, many senior leaders who we're working together with, is that the um, entrepreneurial projects would uh, help us to achieve that first purpose of ISKCON. And this is what we are aiming at. And this is what we are encouraging our alumni to create serious scale, because first and foremost, sign of spiritual entrepreneur is thinking big. And uh, <clears throat> we're encouraging our students and alumni to think really big and try to do something very serious for the global spiritual upliftment, and they do. And uh, it's very amazing how kind of young and seemingly simple devotees are getting empowered just by a couple of months of the training. And they start doing things they could never imagine before. And was there a specific moment or experience that you had that sort of triggered, say, a re uh, the realization of the necessity for fulfilling, say, this first purpose? Well, because uh, this was my initial inspiration for, the, for joining the movement, because I knew that God is one and all these religious differences have nothing to do with spiritual life. They are sectarian by definition. And this is the bad side of the religions, that they create these divides between people. And that's why the first purpose was always inspiration for me. And I could see Prabhupada's teachings and his example that he, he was always working towards that. And uh, example of my own spiritual master, he is very regularly involved in interfaith dialogues. And he is very innovative and he is very broad minded in his um, presentation of Krishna consciousness, despite of serious criticism. <laughs> of course, he's holding the biggest chanting event on the planet every year. Naturally, he has many people who are jealous of him. And uh, other spiritual leaders who are thinking, you know, and they are the most influential, like His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj. His book, Journey Home, is just crystal cut illustration for the first purpose of his gone and um, uh, His Holiness Jayapataka Maharaj and many other very broad-minded uh, spiritual leaders we have and uh, I'm just trying to humbly contribute uh, whatever I can to that fulfillment because it's uh, very inspiring and yeah, this I, I believe that if we do that, Krishna consciousness will be highly appreciated by the whole world. And even though not everyone would be able to become full-time devotees, but the reputation of the movement, the appreciation for Krishna consciousness would uh, increase manifold if we do that. 
Thank you. Are there any other projects that you have a passion for or maybe you haven't taken up yourself but would like to see others take up? Yes, uh, what we are, we are trying to encourage uh, the devotees in two things. One is to very actively um, get involved in uh, multi-faith projects. A faith cooperation, Prabhupada said in one, at least on one rec record that to one Christian leader can let's work together to establish God consciousness. So that was Prabhupada's clear desire to work with other sincere faith leaders on the first purpose of Wisconsin. So that's one thing we're encouraging uh, qualified devotees to do. And the other one which is especially relevant for leaders uh, of, this, of the communities is to be very, very serious about communications and not just communicate on a minimal level trying to get some permissions for Ratha Yatras, Harinams or festivals or Prasadam distribution and things like that, but actually connect with um, influential people uh, exploring possibilities of collaboration with them and actually uh, offering spiritual solutions to the problems uh, they have in uh, in their responsible positions and that combination Prabhupada was dreaming of and he says very clearly in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that unless there is this cooperation between uh, leaders of the society and spiritual leaders, uh, there will be no serious development of Krishna consciousness. And then he gives example of Maharaja Shok, how Buddhism was widespread by his support. So these two things are very important, interfaith, cooperation and communications. Thank you again so much for joining us here. We, uh, everyone in Niskan Sydney is very happy to have you here and we're very much anticipating further visits. Just to wrap up, I was just wondering if you had any heartfelt message or general instruction or advice for not just the people in Sydney but all of the members of ISKCON around the world. Yeah. Sometimes we are focused on serving Krishna, devotional service, which is very nice, but the advanced level of Krishna consciousness, which is the most exciting level, is to serve devotees of Krishna. Because Krishna himself has, says that whoever is serving, whoever claims to be my devotee is not really my devotee, but one who claims to be devotee of my devotee is my real devotee. And so the more devotees we cover by with our services, the more we please Krishna. And so if we just focus on serving as many devotees as we can, that will be our guarantee in spiritual advancement. Hare Krishna.